right, so before we start this one, remember one thing for sure. King David tells us and records the gold of Ophir historically as arriving in Egypt, being worn by uh, Egyptian royalty in his era, about 1000 B.C., he also says that he got a hold of a good amount of gold and silver from Ophir and Tarshish. So, you know, this is also further affirmation that somehow the ships of Tarshish, before Solomon ever built a navy, uh, the ships from the Philippines were making it somehow to Israel before there was a Red Sea port. Now, they uh, we've covered the history of the ships of the Philippines, uh, and we can find in ancient times the Belungai, which is a very large, uh, very large vessel, some as large as 80 feet long. I know some laughed, oh, the Philippines couldn't do that, and then they found it in archaeology. Yes, it's actually 80 feet long, just as Pigafetta recorded in 1521. Duh. See, dunderheads calling themselves academics are out there. And they like to take these narratives and just really mess them up. And it's sad that that's the case. We've had to sift through so many things like that. But, so why on earth, though, uh, let's advance to a further time. Uh, why don't many academics and scholars uh, have a clue that Columbus charted his course, as did Magellan, for the Isles in Southeast Asia? How can that possibly be a mystery? Um, no, not the Spice Islands. That's stupidity and scholarship and academia repeats it all the time. Uh, not, not their words. No, not their writings. No, that's not what they said. Uh, the intention was for them to get to the land that King Solomon went to for gold, called Ophir and Tarshish. Both of them say so. Both of them record it. Both of them went to or wanted to go to that land. Columbus didn't make it. He hit continents in the way. Uh, but Magellan figured out a way through that, and he finally did get there. But when he did get through, he set a course right for the Philippines. How about that? Because that was his destination. And, oh, how about that? That's where he landed. Hmm. Now, we've covered their words on that already in this series, but let's talk about the maps they used for their journey, since we are on the mapping mindset here. Now, what did they show? Well, this really is the end of the debate. I mean, there's nothing to challenge here and no possible way to look at these any other way. Uh, especially when you add it all up. Uh, it, 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 are you kidding? Uh, only an idiot would try to debate. No one can nor will touch this, and whether academia ever accepts this or not, well, who cares? They're too stuck in their political correctness, worried that someone might think that they actually said, uh, you know, the British were wrong about something in history. Well, the British are wrong. The British play stupid. So don't you play stupid like them. Uh, that's not academic. If it is, don't be academic. <laughs> I mean, you, you basically have redefined the word as the opposite. That's pretty bad. Now, we'll bypass them and go right to the people, which is what we've done and what we'll continue to do. Somehow, especially those who have never reviewed this series or uh, read the search for King Solomon's treasure, along with our source book. By the way, that's free in ebook at OphirInstitute.com. Uh, let's get right to it. What did Columbus and Magellan, through his historian Pigafetta, uh, so both wrote, uh, Magellan had a writer, but same thing, uh, what did they write of their intended trips? Well, this again is so easy. It's right there. It's been right there all along. Uh, you would think not a single academic could even try to debate, yet they don't even know this. They don't even know this information in the most credible of sources. I mean, if you're an historian, if you're teaching a class and you haven't actually read Columbus's journal, stop. Stop teaching about Columbus because you don't know anything. If you haven't read Magellan's journal, which is written by Pigafetta, uh, it's Pigafetta's journal, uh, but that's his historian, then you don't know Magellan. 
So don't pretend that you do. This again is so easy and you would think they couldn't get it wrong. Let's go right to the sources. Okay, you may not know this uh, because of course we're, we're not taught accurately, uh, but these explorers kept journals. And again, Magellan even had an historian with him who kept the journal. So, which is really, he's recording Magellan's words and thoughts as well. So, this is super well documented. And how any academic could screw this up escapes us. Because it shouldn't be possible. Uh, but, yet they do. Especially those trying to place Tarshish in Spain or Britain. Uh, can you read? Obviously, you can't. Don't pretend you know history, and that includes uh, Dr. Mike out there, uh, who's out there, you know, propagating that Tarshish is Spain. No, that's stupid. Grow up and learn. Now, this is Columbus's journal, translated to English, of course. Here's what he said. And who cares what any so-called PhD Pharisee dunderhead says when they can't even read this? It exposes them, in fact, as propagandists, especially because, certainly, uh, they, they just can't be this stupid, and they're not. They're smart men. They make themselves stupid for propaganda's sake because they're stuck in a box, in a paradigm that they just can't see beyond. But let's read. Columbus wrote this in his journal. I cannot understand their language this is after he landed in uh, the Caribbean. But I believe that is of the island of Sipangu. Now, what's that? That's Japan. Uh, but on the maps Columbus used, Japan is misplaced in the Philippines and a huge, massive island, which it's nowhere near that large. Only based on legends, that's not an actual uh, proper location. But nonetheless, it's in that area of the world, and they hadn't explored that area much at that point. So no surprise, that was their mindset. See, Columbus too and Magellan had mindsets that we need to understand in order to teach it. Unfortunately, many teach unqualified because they don't even read the journals of these guys. If you don't read what they wrote or the people very close to them wrote, then what do you know about them? Nothing. That they recount these wonders. Now, Columbus was told there was gold there, uh, but it was very little and took a lifetime for them to accumulate. So we know, and of course we know because Magellan then went to Tarshish and Ophir in the Philippines, uh, which is where Columbus placed it. So we know Columbus didn't land where he wanted to. The Caribbean is not Ophir, Sepangu, Tarshish, or Upaz. It's none of those. Uh, Japan's not in the Caribbean. You know that, right? Okay. Uh, though he invokes all those there, uh, and he was wrong. To his dying day, he didn't know that he was wrong. He would have been sad if he knew that he hit those darn American continents uh, that were in the way. <laughs> not that you demean those. Those are valuable territories indeed, but they're not Ophir, Tarshish, or Upaz, or Sepangu in the slightest. That is illiterate to say. Uh, so why? Because he thought he was in the Philippines. That's what he thought. That's what he mapped. That's the maps he was following. That's what he claimed he wanted to find. Ophir, Tarshish, the Garden of Eden, and the land of Arsareth. He says in his words, in his journals and notes. We've covered that. So those sources are in our source book. You can find those. The climate seemed right. The tropics indeed, no doubt. But the maps he used did not know of the Americas. Again, it's a mindset and not a surprise for that era, as the Americas were not discovered by the West yet, at least not in the mindset of the colonialists. No surprise. Uh, yes, the Vikings were there. Yes, uh, you know, even from the West Coast, uh, others came, in fact, likely Filipinos, Austronesians, uh, made their way to Hawaii and then further into the Americas. Uh, and there may very well be a relation, though no one's proven it yet, between the Filipino and Austronesians and the Native American Indians. You'll even find very similar looks, skin tone, etc. Wouldn't be a surprise. But anyway, uh, now we all know this is the case, but some still use this claim, the Americas is Ophir. 
or Christ, which, again, is incredibly illiterate, in the wrong direction, and fits nothing anywhere in this narrative whatsoever. So how did Columbus navigate to there? Well, what did he use? Hmm. This is not a mystery, because he tells you. Some try to undermine the credibility of this when Columbus said he used it. Duh! Think. On the spheres I saw, what's he talking about? He's talking about the map, the one sphere. He had multiple copies, perhaps. Uh, but he's talking about the globes. This is extremely specific, because the very first globe of the world is also the one he had with him. Now, this isn't real hard. It's called the Behind Globe, and it's based on Portuguese data commissioned by the Portuguese government. This is a Portuguese government map. Uh, a guy named Behind, a German, uh, actually, uh, you know, took care of the project, oversaw the project. But nevertheless, uh, that's what it was, and it was released in 1492 in the same year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Of course, he may have even had an advanced copy, but nevertheless. And on the delineations of the map of the world, so there's a second map. So there's two maps he used here. Uh, you'll find they both agree, especially on this point. Sepengu is in this region. Well, indeed, it is on that map. Japan is uh, in the Philippines in that mapping, way out of place, way out of position, and way too large. I mean, like, monstrously way too large, which is okay. It's based on the legends of likely Marco Polo, uh, not on actual Portuguese data in that instance, which is no surprise. They weren't up there in Japan at this point. That wasn't really their focus. What were they looking for? They were looking for Christ, or Ophir, and Tarshish, Argyre. So Magellan will find it. Now notice, the footnotes at the bottom in Columbus's journal specify what these two maps were. The first map he used, the sphere, the globe, again, the very first globe map of the Earth period. So it's not real hard to figure that out anyway, right? But it says right there in his journal. It's the globe of Martin Behaim, made in 1492. Uh, so, uh, folks, that's called a credible map, and it was used by Columbus on his trip. There you go. So the illiterate blogger that tries to undermine the mapping is just plain stupid and doesn't know nor represent history. Now, we'll look at this in a second, but we've shown this map several times. When we read this map, Columbus's mindset is so obvious. Even a PhD can understand it. How about that? Yeah, just like the Geico commercial, it's so easy a caveman could do it. Well, if the shoe fits. Hmm. Anyway, the second map... Columbus had with him and used in is the uh, world map of Toscanelli. That's an Italian, just like Columbus was an Italian. So I'm sure he probably knew him. They may have even been friends. I don't know. Uh, so if we review these two maps, we again know what shaped Columbus's journey. But notice one other thing. We're talking about a German mapping for the Portuguese. Now we see Italian. Columbus was Italian, but also sailed for Spain. Um, hello. I mean, th this mindset was throughout Europe. And I mean, even Sebastian Cabot sailed to Tarshish and Ophir. That's in his contract written by the King of Spain. Uh, and he was British. So yes, there were British that knew this as well. This mindset was well entrenched. It's only the British who fought it, and the way they fought it was to ignore it. It never happened. Magellan never happened. Columbus never happened as far as his directions to Ophir. Just didn't happen. Never existed. <laughs> they are about as illiterate as any scholar could be. Then we get to Magellan. 20 plus years later, uh, again, obviously the King of Spain and Magellan knew that Columbus didn't find Ophir in Tarshish. So to say that's in America, again, utterly stupid. That's not academic. It's not supported by anything whatsoever. Uh, now, that's not that long, by the way, <laughs> a little over 20 years. Uh, really not a big deal. Uh, pretty close to the same era. Uh, Magellan identified he was headed to Ophir and Tarshish, as did Columbus. Now, we're going to show you even uh, what Magellan wrote uh, in his brother-in-law's journal in a second. But they were both seeking the ancient land of gold, not spices as much, 
Uh, sure, they wanted spices too. They're worth money. Uh, but that's not what they were seeking. They, they, the spice islands were already discovered. They, they wouldn't, that wouldn't be monumental. No, they wanted to find the uh, ancient land of gold, Ophir and Tarshish, in their own words. If you can read, that is, of course. You have to be able to read their academics. Uh, sorry that many cannot. Now, that's another false narrative in academia formed from those reading Magellan's answer to Filipinos, by the way. Uh, when he told them he was just passing through their lands, he was lying. He was telling them what they needed to hear. Of course, he didn't say, I'm here to steal your gold. <laughs> I, how academic are you when you can't see through that? Uh, especially when we know what he said uh, he was doing and where he was going. An academic repeating that lie, just wake up. That, that's nonsense. Here again, the most valid, credible history of an eyewitness and very well-established scholar, Antonio Pigafetta with Magellan. Uh, Pigafetta's journal records the marine chart used by Magellan. And there's only one listed. Is that made by a great pilot and mariner, mariner named Martin of Bohemia? Martin, behind. Notice the footnote at the bottom, though anyone can read that and know exactly what it's saying very easily. Uh, but here you go. Uh, just so you know, that's definitely Martin behind. Um, of course, the idiot blogger can't even read. Uh, so you have to show him the footnotes and you have to show him everything because, well, he's a child who can't reason even in elementary senses. Uh, it says Martin Beheim, a globe was constructed at Nuremberg, Germany, uh, under the instructions of Martin Beheim in 1492. Now, we covered before it was the Portuguese government who hired Beheim to do this to fashion the first globe map of the world. The same one Columbus had. See, you cannot get more credible and both Columbus and Magellan specifically use this map in their navigations. Is it perfect? No, of course not. Does it have to be? No, but it advanced for that period. So to take a map prior to it and try to overrule it is stupid. Okay, let's just be clear. This is based on Portuguese data, and they controlled much of Malaysian Indonesia at that time. They knew this area. They had explored it very well already. And they knew where Ophir and Tarshish were. Magellan says so. And Columbus knew as well from their data. But these maps know. So, duh. Uh, that's because simply they, I mean, you, you cannot misread this map uh, in this regard indeed. Let's see. So here we go. The first globe of the world used by Columbus and Magellan. The most credible map of that era, period. And nothing to discuss on that. The Beheim Globe of 1492, commissioned by the Portuguese government. This is the full map. And of course, you would wrap it around uh, and fit it together as a sphere. Okay, that's why you see the way that it's shaped, uh, of course. However, what you can see from this full view is the world is coming into uh, a much much more accurate, closer view to what it actually is than most previous maps because uh, of especially Portuguese explorations, which the British ignore. So when the British ignore that credible data, well, they're just plain stupid. Let's just be honest. Uh, but basically into the Far East, we're now seeing uh, the definition, definition we didn't see before on maps. That includes who sailed for Portugal to the Far East uh, before uh, he did so uh, for the Spanish, uh, you know, Magellan and Barbosa with him, the famous explorer, his brother-in-law, who was his number two and became Captain General when Magellan was killed and then he was killed as well. So uh, also under this mindset, he well understood. See, these guys knew what they were doing and they were experts. You can't ignore them. And the British do. Understand this is almost 1500 years after the previous maps we showed you. And yes, the world knew this data still and knew it well. And they were really honing in on it and finding it. They were locating Christ and Argyre or Ophir and Tarshish, which is where Columbus and Magellan were going to these islands. 
Really, it is only the British who play ignorant, yet are proven wrong many times over. They have to say, nuh-uh, to Portugal, to Spain, to the Germans, who behind was, to the Italians, as the next map says, uh, this same data in at least some of it, not in as much detail, and even to British explorer Sebastian Cabot, who, of course, they undermine and try to claim, oh, he wasn't a real explorer. Yeah, you're not a real historian, so shut your mouth. Um, you, you don't know what you're talking about, obviously. If the king of Spain hired someone to explore, he's an explorer. Duh. That's just stupid. Anyway, who just after Magellan, he was hired to return to Ophir and Tarshish in the Philippines. He didn't make it, but nevertheless. Uh, and the king of Spain wrote that into the contract, even. Duh. Uh, it's really not academic, nor scholarship. Uh, the British are propagandists in this regard, as we have proven in the British East Indies Company paying off Samuel Purchase to commit such propaganda since 1525. This is uh, not, I'm sorry, 1625, maybe. Uh, yeah, I don't remember the year off the top of my head, but it's something like that. Um, but very, very early. And how does he do it? Well, he just ignores the very globe, Columbus, and Magellan, the first globe map of the world, the most credible mapping of the era, uh, carried with them and used. I mean, that's incredibly stupid and not academic and in the slightest. It's just propaganda. Now, he ignores all of this uh, to land on multiple locations of Ophir and Tarshish, of which, in his mindset, the Philippines doesn't even exist. Uh, and never had a claim, which is stupid, because uh, obviously it did, uh, very well recorded from the Spanish and the Portuguese, uh, and even the, uh, you know, the Germans, the Italians, the French, uh, you know, you see this uh, theme throughout, yet somehow the British didn't seem to know, yes, actually they did, they're lying, they're committing propaganda, that's what they're doing. Uh, it was already proven, and they were already proven wrong, very sad. Uh, that's not a position. Uh, it's a guy sitting in the corner wearing a dunce cap, and that's where we should keep him, by the way, uh, because he has nothing credible to say, nor do the British on this whole topic, as they can't even read. And you're talking about the same paradigm, the British Museum, who actually took the, the head of an orangutan or whatever it was, of some sort of ape, and put it on top of a man's body in complete and utter fraud called Piltdown Down Man, uh, at the turn of the century, uh, around the 1900 era, and they actually passed it off, pawned it off, said that was the missing link. Talk about frauds. But see, that's the way the British have operated uh, over history well proven. And they do it here indisputably. You can see Africa to the left. Now, the Americas are missing, uh, which is why Columbus ran into them. He didn't know they were there. The Baha'i Globe doesn't know they're there. The Portuguese didn't really know at that time either. Uh, certainly not in their entirety, as large as two continents especially. Uh, he thought that, uh, you know, he was in the Far East uh, because he thought the Far East was much closer than it was. Again, due to these, these two maps, actually, this map and the other. Uh, that he used especially. Does it make these, these maps useless? No, because with these maps in the proper mindset, understanding how they think, but reconciling and correcting it, these maps are perfect. Advance to the east, and you see India, Sri Lanka, Burma, even identified on this map as, well, Ptolemy's area, Cherasonesis. Now, that was never the Malay Peninsula, but Burma. And the Portuguese, Germans, Italians, and some even uh, British, well, knew this. <clears throat> when academia then treats that as a mystery, let's not pretend they are practicing scholarship. They are not. That is a paradigm of stupid, no matter how you shake it. You can see the Malay Peninsulas. Uh, you can see Sumatra, Java Maj Minor, uh, Java Major, which is Borneo. Now, we have a key point there. And what do we have? Well, does everybody know where Borneo is on a map? Okay. Now, picture that. Uh, good. Now, head northeast of Borneo, which is southeast of China, just below the Tropic of Cancer in some of the directions, the very north, um, across from Indochina in the South China Sea. And you are in what? 
Africa? Are you kidding? How stupid. That is the Philippines, period. There's no other option. There's nothing else there. Within this red square, there is Christ, the Greek land of gold, known as Ophir in Hebrew, and Argyre, the Greek land of silver, known as Tarshish in Hebrew, right where the Philippines is located. Nowhere else. Now, that's not the Malay Peninsula. It's not Africa. It's not India. It's not Saudi. It's not Yemen. Nope. It's the Philippines. Now, let's zoom in and we'll look at these uh, distinct islands. This really brings you up to speed to the most credible data of this era in 1492, the Age of Exploration, uh, which is going to search and search and search until it finds the land of gold. That's what they're after more than anything. The Spice Islands are already found at this point. Um, so no, nobody needs to find a route to the Spice Islands. Uh, and the Portuguese already controlled that area, so, uh, you know, that's pretty easy, and everybody knows that, should know that. The British take control of that area later, uh, taking over from the Portuguese, but the reality is they ignore everything that the Portuguese found. Now, that's just stupid. So, why follow them in anything? So, the Portuguese data used by the Spanish, Italians, Germans, and even some Brits remains accurate. You can see on the right, Sepangu, that Columbus mentioned. No, Japan is not that large and not in that position, uh, not that far south, but this is why Columbus thought it was there, and that's no surprise. Uh, he's actually affirming the map uh, when he says that, when he says he saw Sepangu in the Caribbean, which he thinks he's in the Philippines. Understand the mindset, and don't lose that, because you'll lose your context. It was made famous by Marco Polo, Sepangu, uh, but much would still be learned in progressing exploration, of course. There are those that try to say Sepangu is the Philippines. We found no actual evidence of that, uh, and it doesn't need to be. Uh, that's for sure. Now, that's how exploration works, though. You'd be surprised how many can't seem to figure that out either. Christ is not some indistinct location. Oh, no. It sits there, mapped in the area of Luzon Island, Philippines, geographically, above the equator. And get this, southeast of China, just below the Tropic of Cancer. How about that? I mean, is this really hard in the South China Sea? I mean, these directions are so super clear. But see how Luzon even has the curly Q on top? So as a geographic shape, it even matches. Hello, it's so easy. Again, very easy to spot if one doesn't have an agenda, of course, or can't read. Uh, that is the ancient land of gold, period. Then to the south, but still northeast of Borneo, uh, well, anyone who knows geography at all knows that must be Mindanao already, uh, if it's northeast of Borneo in the large island. Uh, and look at that shape. Oh, look at that. It's labeled Argyre, the ancient land of silver, which is Tarshish. And Tarshish has to be the same area as Ophir or Christ, as it has the same resources. And of course it is. It's the same trip, according to the Bible. And the two are interchangeable in scripture, uh, even which we have well proven already. This is why they are the same area with Sheba, Cebu, modern Visayas, Philippines, in between, in fact. Uh, then there are further identifiers right there from the most credible data ever from the Portuguese government. Maniola. Now, this is one. Scholars go by, oh, no, it was here. No, it was there. It was, it was here. No, here it is on the map. It's right there. Okay, Maniola is Manila. Duh. I mean, it's not even hard to see by the name, but it's on the map. It's, it's in the paragraph there. Uh, it's written in German, of course, uh, so you probably won't be able to read it. But I guess, uh, you know, it speaks of the magnetic shoals where many shipwrecks occurred just off the coast of what? Maniola. Manila. Duh. I mean, for any scholar to suggest Maniola is anything else uh, <laughs> but Manila requires willing ignorance. Here it is on the map right there. Again... Uh, that be the Philippines. Then there is the ancient land of pearl. And funny, this is ancient Avila, land of gold, pearl, and the onyx stone. Here you are, the Isle of Gold, Silver, and Pearl. It, it, it's right there. Duh, hello. Uh, it, it, this wasn't lost since Genesis 2 was written. Uh, it's, it's fully affirmed. 
the two there, they're, they're mapped here. Uh, the Isle of Gold, the Isle of Pearl, right there. So two of the three resources from Genesis 2, right there on this map as the infamous Isle of Gold and infamous Isle of Pearl. So it's really hard to miss. Phyllis, the very ancient land of Pearl, really Palawan, uh, which is where the largest pearls on all of the world, in all of history, since we've been keeping track in all of time, period, have come from. Nothing to discuss whatsoever. This is not some arbitrary map by some nobody. This is the world famous first globe of the world commissioned by the Portuguese government. Portuguese government exploration data done there's nothing more credible than that for that era and there we have it ironclad indisputable irrefutable evidence that the philippines is most certainly the ancient land of gold and havila for that matter the land of adam and eve again both columbus and magellan use this map you can see how columbus hit the americas uh, which were in the way here, as this map doesn't have them at all. Uh, they didn't know much about the western route yet, but they will soon. Magellan landed right in between Christ, Argyre, on this map, which is exactly where he was headed. He definitively rediscovered for the west. Of course, there were already people there when he got there, uh, the ancient land of gold, silver, pearl, and the onyx stone of king solomon uh and of the greeks and that's the same place there it is on the map yeah, see hello look at it columbus called this ophir and tarshish christ and argyre same thing same thing just two different languages of the land of gold and the land of silver and that's right there in his writings so you can't really miss it as well as the location he calls of the garden of eden and arsareth where some of the northern kingdom migrated of Israel. How about that? Magellan also labeled it Ophir and Tarshish, even writing it in his copy of his brother-in-law Duarte Barbosa's journal. We'll show you in a second. Uh, if the British ignore this, well, let's not pretend they have anything of value to add to this conversation because they make themselves fools before they begin the discussion. They can't debate because they're debating from a framework of no foundation and complete utter ignorance from a thousand years before forgetting what happened. Now this is the only map Magellan refers to on his trip. It's the only one that Magellan used according to Pigafetta. It's the only one listed uh, and it's one of two that Columbus uses but since Columbus mentions another let's go there too and look at it. Bear in mind this is the more credible uh, indeed, it's the first globe map of the world from Portuguese data, but you'll find the second map, well, it has less detail, but it agrees. How about that? The second of only two maps Columbus notes uh, that he carried uh, on his journey, uh, not that he didn't use others in his research, his research was actually extensive and included, uh, he says, what books of the Bible, and they're very similar to our research where we've gone. Uh, even though we didn't know that before, but we found that Columbus really followed the same track. Uh, he knew what he was talking about. He just didn't know the distance across the Pacific Ocean. And of course, never made it to the Pacific Ocean. He didn't know about the Americas in the way. But he carried this on his journey. He used it to navigate. Uh, this one is 1474, a little bit earlier map of Tuscanelli. This reconstruction, he's an Italian, by the way, which Columbus was as well. This reconstruction captures it well. Uh, notice the island in Southeast Asia. It looks very similar in shape to that of the one on Beheim's globe, Luzon, Philippines. Uh, it's right there, labeled Chrysis or Chrys. Uh, the name for the Greek land of gold, which is the ancient land of gold of the Bible, Ophir. Boom. No one can debate these facts, and especially not in light of all that we've covered on this topic, and they never will. Academia needs to wake up, grow up, and learn, and stop propagating British propaganda of ignorance. It needs to adjust its teaching to the truth and stop playing willing ignorance, and so does Bible scholarship on this topic, which is so far behind every last one of them should be fired, really, uh, and start over with people who can actually read, because they can't. 
uh, even read the Bible. They certainly don't represent it on this topic. Why? Someone doesn't want us to know. But see, it's too late. We all do now. Once uh, Magellan navigated that would become known as the Straits of Magellan, uh, entering the Pacific Ocean, Antonio Pigafetta wrote this. Afterwards, now they've just exited the Pacific, into the Pacific Ocean, exited the Straits of Magellan, uh, we made 200 leagues to westwards. So 200 leagues, less, uh, leagues west. Uh, then changed the course to a quarter of southwest until in 13 degrees north latitude, okay, so 13 degrees north of the equator, in order to approach the land of Cape Gadakar. Well, that's actually Katagara, uh, another European name for the land of gold. We have a, a whole video on that. Watch it. Uh, known as Christ in Greek and Ophir in Hebrew. It's just another name for it uh, in European languages. Same place, and that's where he went. So, duh. So basically, he's telling us that they charted a course to Ophir, to Christ. Right there. There it is. Hello. <laughs> Pretty easy. Now, uh, then he says, which cape, now get this, under correction of those who made cosmography. The cosmographers of before were wrong. Got that? He's correcting them. He's specifically citing Ptolemy here uh, because he mentions Katagara and Ptolemy places it and wrongly at nine degrees south of the equator, which is nowhere close. And those like him and says they needed to be corrected. Magellan corrects them. In other words, they were wrong wrong, but now here's the accurate data. Ignored by the British stupidly. Let's be clear. He tells you it's right there. For they have never seen it. Well, that's why um, they they don't know, and Ptolemy didn't know in his age, so he's not he's not calling Ptolemy out as, as being anything but a scholar, uh, but he just didn't know this. That's all. He didn't make the trip. Exactly as we've said so many times. Ptolemy didn't make this trip. Uh, he did this. Uh, he did his best uh, with what he had to work with, uh, which was practically nothing uh, on Southeast Asia. And he draws nothing on Southeast Asia. So it's just not even there on his mapping. So Magellan is correcting all of them before him in modern times uh, since they tried to reconnect this old Greek, Phoenician, and Israelite route to the land of gold, which Rome lost. Get that. Britain, however, will take you back to that mindset, uh, you know, basically walking knowledge back a thousand years in the dumbest form of scholarship in modern times. So illiterate. And they are doing it on purpose in propaganda, they've even been caught paying people to do so. And that's even dumber. So here he goes. Here's the correction. And yes, Magellan knew and proved to be right. So there is nothing to discuss or debate here. Is not placed where they think. Hmm, they're wrong. But is towards the north. So it's north of the equator. In 12 degrees or thereabouts. So 12 degrees north of the equator. There you go. The general area, which is what? It's the Philippines. Duh. And that's what's on the maps that he was using. So it's really not difficult. I mean, Pigafetta says, here's the map he used. And he was headed to 12 degrees north of the equator in Southeast Asia to islands. And oh, um, just so happens, that's the Philippines. Duh. Anyone that can't put that together is is just illiterate of this whole narrative and history in this regard. They're not, they're, there's nothing to debate. Nothing to debate. We have well proven this. The area identified here, as you see drawn to the right, is specifically where Magellan landed, even between Samar and Leyte, Philippines. And in that area, there is even a place called Caragara, Leyte, and Katarman, some Samar, uh, for that matter. So very close, both of them, to Katagara. Uh, that is where Magellan was headed and where he landed. Not the Spice Islands, which he already sailed and knew for Portugal before, uh, 
what he was doing and what Spain was doing is getting around the choke point where Portugal had a monopoly on the route to the East Indies because they controlled the Straits of Malacca, or the waters between the Malay Tip and Sumatra. That's a key. Uh, they could choke everything there because even in that era, they weren't going out over in the open seas as much. They were hugging the coast smartly uh, in such a long trip. They would not have let Spain through uh, to get to Ophir that way. And in fact, they did stop a ship after Magellan. Uh, and, and that's also recorded in the Spanish documents. So uh, they tried to sail through to the east. So yeah, that's why they needed the western route. That's why Spain went for it. So Ptolemy's geography of Southeast Asia was wrong uh, and corrected by Magellan. Okay, again, no big deal. Ptolemy's still a good dude as far as... Uh, he was a scholar mapping the world, the whole world, and he did a pretty good job for the mindset of the age. Uh, but he didn't even map Southeast Asia, so to claim that he did is illiterate. Uh, how many in academia, though, even know this? Uh, we've not found anyone really, though, <laughs> there. Maybe some who probably watch this channel. Uh, so get this, we have not only broken down the Bible data very well, even the Hebrew and identify Ophir and the Garden of Eden in the Philippines, but history and geography leaves nothing to debate. Ignoring history is not a position, and it's rather stupid, generally. But let's address Ptolemy's geography. There are even books out there that claim the Malay Peninsula is Ptolemy's golden chair senesis. How stupid. Uh, it's supposed to be Ophir in Christ, of course, the land of gold. Uh, they're trying to make that connection. And yes, that's what Ptolemy was seeking, yet there's a massive problem with this. First, every narrative on Ophir, Christ, the land of gold, are islands, never peninsulas, period. Also, beyond the Malay tip. They go into the South China Sea because they're southeast of China, just below, we just showed you, the writings, they're right there, just below the tropic or line of cancer. He had no clue of Southeast Asian geography. Just look at his map. And this is rather accurate to uh, what he wrote. I mean, not even a little. We just showed you the behind globe, which identifies Burma as Talabay's Golden Peninsula, not the Malay Peninsula. So this has always been a lie for Malaysia propagated by the British, actually, not Malaysians. Let's be clear. Uh, when Pinto asked the Malaysians where Ophir Christ was, they pointed him to the Philippines. They knew better, and that's why they, including their own tourism department, still reject the name Mount Ophir for their historic mountain to this day, still maintaining the name Ganung Ladang. And they still use the old one, even in their materials. So how about that? That wasn't even named until 1801 in fraud by the British. Uh, in a desperate attempt to debate an argument they already lost and massively overwhelmed uh, with facts, with geography, science, archaeology, uh, with the Bible. I mean, they're done. They're toast already on this issue. They have no stance. They continued, though, because they commit propaganda. They do not want us to know where this land of gold is. They never found it and only prove they can't read and ignore history to form false narratives. Now here's the 1532 map of Grinius, uh, which concurs with the Baha'im globe regarding the uh, Golden Peninsula of Ptolemy, area Chersonesis, uh, cited uh, right here. It's on Burma. That's not the Malay Peninsula. That's Burma. Let's be clear, that area is not Ophir. It's not the land of gold in any history, which is not a peninsula, first of all. Ptolemy was wrong, says Magellan. Can you get more credible than that? Uh, no, you can't. Your modern uh, dunderhead, certainly not credible when they go against what Magellan found and discovered and practically uh, documented very well. Why, though? We'll show you. Because Ptolemy thought the Indian Ocean ended just beyond Burma and was enclosed. He didn't know 
of the Malay Peninsula, nor the tens of thousands of islands and the largest ocean beyond it. Magellan told us why. Ptolemy never went there. He didn't know. It's okay that he didn't know. He has a pretty good map, but not for Southeast Asia. It's worthless. Why does Ptolemy try to change history, though, uh, of this being islands illiterately? Well, because he could only identify the lands there to Burma, which is a peninsula. So he called it a peninsula. Uh, and there are no significant isles there, and that is not the land of gold and silver, period. In other words, he guessed very poorly, but because he could only see as far as a peninsula at the end, which was not Malay, but Burma. He changed the island to a peninsula. That's called fraud, and he shouldn't have. He just shouldn't have. But that's how error occurs. Uh, yes, he should have known better, but far worse uh, is every stupid scholar that can't see that and takes this map and then tries to find anything in Southeast Asia, which is ridiculous. Uh, it doesn't even exist on this map, so why would you? How illiterate. The blind leading the blind. Magellan corrected this map. And he was a qualified expert to do so more than any modern scholar who can't overrule him. This rendering of Ptolemy shows how far he was off, really. <laughs> uh, and you can correct Katagara to Magellan's 12th to 13th degree north of the equator, which he says he's correcting, especially Ptolemy. Uh, Ptolemy was wrong, and again, cut him some slack. He created a great map for his area, era, and useful in many ways, just not for Southeast Asia, which is non-existent. Nothing to discuss on that, yet we have found several who use only this map to bolster false claims and attempt debate. How dumb is that? And they don't even know they are debating from a foundation of nothing, because that is what Ptolemy knew of ancient geography in Southeast Asia. Nothing, really. Ophir, Christ, is never a peninsula in any credible narrative, so he even changes the narrative to try to fit it to his perspective, which is wrong. Uh, it is an island, a part uh, often of, of an, an uh, archipelago, in fact, um, you can see Ptolemy placed it at 9 degrees south of the equator, and it's on another peninsula, of course, uh, or actually enclosed land, uh, which is wrong again. And his, you know, his is one that encloses the Indian Ocean. Uh, so he really doesn't know the geography, and it's nothing to use as anything in terms of credible fact. Uh, he just picked up some legends and put them on there, but he doesn't know anything about them, really. Magellan, although he's in the general area of the Far East, he's almost there, but not quite. Magellan moved it up to between, correcting it, to between the 12th and 13th degree north of the equator. So Ptolemy was off, proven by Magellan, over 20 degrees latitude uh, and much further off in terms of distance to the east. Uh, I mean, just... He's corrected right there by Magellan uh, in exactness. So you really can't argue that. Uh, east, he didn't know, uh, existed geographically. That's the problem. Uh, not any further than, than what his map shows. Uh, he's got the Sunda Isles before Burma, uh, which is way off. They're not there. They're around the corner uh, beyond the Malay Peninsula, which he doesn't know existed. Uh, he places Sabadiba, or Sheba, which is the Philippines, uh, especially in, in uh, ladder maps, uh, show that specifically as the whole Philippines was called Sabadiba, which is another name for Sheba, Saba. Uh, just before Burma, way off, of course. Uh, he places Japan uh, just to the east of Burma, which is way, way off. Uh, then Katagora, the land of gold, on a peninsula when it has to be an island. And again, uh, there's Magellan's correction. Uh, we really need to understand this. Again, let us not forget Magellan, just as Columbus specified, he was going to Ophir and Tarshish, the land of gold, which is the European Katagara, uh, to which he charted a course. His brother-in-law and fellow Portuguese explorer, uh, when they were in the Far East previously uh, on their other trips for the Portuguese, 
uh, identified this people who arrived in Vietnam or Indochina uh, in large ships to trade uh, from across the sea. FYI, the only islands across the sea from Indochina are called the Philippines. Duh. Uh, anyone calling themselves a scholar that doesn't know that is utterly illiterate on this topic. Barbosa identifies them as the Lucos. Oh, really hard. Those are the Ilocanos of Ilocos. Duh. Uh, not just obvious etymologically, but indisputably by the reference to this people in history. Even Luzon Island is also known as Lucan hmm, or Luconia. Uh, it's really not hard. Magellan has a copy of Barbosa's journal at this point. Uh, he used in his research, and in his copy, uh, he crossed out Lucos and wrote in Ophir and Tarshish. And that's the Philippines, and that's what he's identifying right there as Ophir and Tarshish, the biblical land of gold of King Solomon, period. That's according to author Charles E. Now, who saw this in a French journal of history, which he provides even uh, as a source. Uh, we cover this in our source book, and we have uh, there. Uh, though it's not in museums anymore, not easy to find, you can actually still search uh, for keywords, and you can find uh, that this is still able to be affirmed to this day. We cover that in our source book for the search for King Solomon's treasure. See, folks, we're not making a claim here. We're proving, and we've certainly proven this. Watch the uh, the Lucos of Ilocano, uh, of uh, Ilocos, sorry. I think that's the name of the video uh, within this series. Uh, but the Lucos are well-defined in different accounts. Uh, this map shows uh, where they were seen throughout the Far East in different historical accounts. Uh, and it shows you who it is, and then it anchors, the number there anchors to our source book. So you can uh, download our source book free from ophirinstitute.com. Check it out for yourself. The numbers are there, and they correspond. Barbosa Barbosa said they came to Indochina from the islands across the South China Sea, the Philippines. That's where the Lucos originate. And Pinto and De Barros encountered their large ships in Malaysia. And Pinto was shipwrecked on the islands of Lucos, which he specifically provided coordinates that lead us to Northwest Luzon Island, or Ilocos. The Lucos of Ilocos, the Ilocanos. Duh. Uh, Pigafetta learned of the Lucos in Cebu as traders who came down Northwest Luzon Island, is where they came from, uh, to trade with the Cebuanas in their giant junk ships, fitting these narratives, all of them agree. Uh, he also notes them in Saba as well. In fact, D. Castaneda uh, writes in the 1800s, he's uh, talking you know, much later, but before, and he says of Pinto that he was shipwrecked on the Isles of Lucos uh, when he talks of that uh, account, uh, that that's positioned southeast of China. That's called the Philippines in any geography whatsoever. Uh, there's no other way to view this, period. Now, we're just adding in some extra data that supports this, but there's tons more we've already covered. But the official uh, government document, uh, number 98 of the Spanish government, uh, identifies Ophir as Lucos, just as Magellan, and it places it and Tarshish in the Philippines, taking a route from Spain to the Far East, uh, hugging the coast until uh, the uh, you know they pass the Deadly Shoals, of course, and then they cross from basically China, South China, to Luzon, uh, Ophir, Lucos. Pretty simple, very easy to follow. The directions are in Spanish, uh, but easy to see, and we also have that in our source book. You can see it there. Even just charting the markers uh, in Bible data is so obvious, especially the resources, which we also chart and cover. Uh, and you can watch that. I think it's part one, I want to say 1D of this series. Uh, but testing the resources, you can find the video pretty easily. Uh, and it's a 100% fit to the Philippines, uh, but the other claimants all fail. So there's nothing to discuss here, folks. But... Uh, Ophir is an archipelago of isles, not one island, by the way. It's east of the Red Sea and really east of Mashhad, Iran, where Ophir migrated 
uh, to uh, and from uh, to the east. Uh, they are the Isles of Gold and Silver, in which the Philippines is the only match to history, especially in ancient times, having the alluvial deposits sitting on the ground and just below the surface even, documented in history. It must be a multitude many islands, an archipelago. Uh, it's a far off, not just down the Red Sea, it's a far country uh, in the uttermost parts of the earth, says Messiah. Uh, the same region as Tarshish, uh, it is a country identified with a large bird of prey and it just so happens. The Philippine eagle uh, is the largest eagle on earth by far. I know some say, oh no, it's this one, it's that one. No, read uh, and watch what we cover, uh, but read our book. Uh, there's seven categories. Uh, that you would uh, categorize and, and test this. Uh, and in five of the seven, uh, the Philippine Eagle is number one. Case solved. Uh, it's number two and number three and the other two. So there's no close second and there's nothing to discuss here. It's the Philippine Eagle. It is a three-year round-trip journey, according to Chronicles, uh, from the Red Sea and to the east and beyond the Arabian Sea, which is the Indian Ocean in this ancient mindset in the Bible. Uh, what isles are just beyond the east exit of the Indian Ocean? Well, Enoch told us the same thing. The Book of Jubilees tells us the same thing. Noah left directions and Moses wrote them down as well. This is no mystery. This is the Philippines, which is the only option whatsoever. And yes, they circumnavigated Africa to get there in the days of the Greeks. They had to. The Red Sea port was broken up in 800 BC. And again, even the ships of Tarshish from the Philippines, according to Jonah, historically were found in Joppa, Israel, navigating circumnavigating Africa, uh, coming around into the Mediterranean all the way to Israel that way. So no other claims are left at this point. They have all failed long ago. So Columbus and Magellan specify they use the behind globe of 1492 to chart their course. And that is the expert as to where Christ, Sophia, and Argyre Tarshish are. The world knew, and it was and is, in the Philippines. They say so in their own words and writings, so this is not up for debate. And no one can disprove Magellan and Columbus especially. Uh, you heard it from their own words. They used that map, that map shows the Philippines is the ancient land of gold and silver, uh, also in Columbus's words, the Garden of Eden uh, in all of history, and I mean, no one can touch that. Those who try, almost always, try to use Ptolemy's erroneous map, which we just covered, uh, which is absent Southeast Asian geography completely. Really? Uh, those things he shows are way out of position and nowhere near accurate, and we know this as well because Magellan corrected him and said he was, in fact. But the British, of course, ignore Magellan, so they don't know that. End of discussion. Done. Settled. And this means what? Well, it means since these two explorers were the first attempts at the route through the West for obvious reason, uh, it means the ancients got there from the East. This means the Greeks most certainly circumnavigated Africa because they had to. And it is laughable that any scholar would say the Phoenicians and Greeks would be incapable. And yes, there is archaeology that even proves it we covered uh, in the previous videos, as well as history we covered, and now maps, geography. So uh, not really a question anymore. However, in this video, uh, we're going to take you all the way back uh, in the next video, we're going to take you all the way back to 800 BC and prove the Greeks, in fact, in their own words, indisputably circumnavigated Africa way back then and many references, mind you, you'll see. They documented well and many, many times coming very soon. We have over 470 videos on this channel, one for every day of the year plus now. Uh, many just as profound with some 50 or so in Tagalog for Filipinos and now six in Spanish to start. We also have been setting up subtitles for 20 plus languages for most of our videos. 
Don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications of new uploads. Join our email list as YouTube fails to notify often. And we will notify you ourselves at thegodculture.com. Just fill in the pop-up there. We now have alternative platforms for videos on Rumble, Odyssey, and Utreon. And our new podcast is available for all of our videos pretty much as well. All links in the description box and friend us on Facebook at The God Culture Space hyphen Space Original. That is our only Facebook page, only one that we're checking and using. Uh, if you prefer an alternative, we now have Parlor and Gab links below. We have six books published internationally being read in over 100 countries. Uh, and actually, I correct that. It's now seven. How about that? Uh, with our new release, the first book of Bible History Illustrated, Enoch's Animal Dream Visions. We also have now launched Ophir Philippines Coffee Table Book in the U.S., Canada, U.K., and many overseas markets on Amazon. And it's available in hardcover or softcover there. Also, this uh, first book of Bible History Illustrated is available only in color. We're not even doing this in black and white. Only in color, and you can get it in color, uh, soft cover, or hard cover on Amazon. Uh, coming to the Philippines soon. Not yet. We're not there yet, but we will get there. Additionally, we launched the Book of Jubilees, the Torah calendar, with color maps and interiors, as so many had requested that overseas. Uh, rightfully so. Uh, we already have that in the Philippines. Uh, the Philippine copies have color maps inside already. Uh, that too is available on Amazon in hardcover, softcover, both in color or in black and white softcover if you wish. Uh, all books including Solomon's Treasurer are now free in ebook. Uh, we're not going to do an ebook for this one because we have this video series animated and we're going to release one with all five uh, as one video as well so no need to do an ebook when we'll have the video animation and more coming soon thank you for watching now always remember prove all things for yourself Yah bless to everyone